now we're going to finish what we have started quite a long time ago, and this is calculating the properties of an ideal gas from the partition function. So last time we got our final expression for the partition function. But remember that we use some approximations. We assume the temperature is high enough that particles are mostly in different energy levels, and temperature is high enough that we can use density of state approximation. So this is really a high T answer, and we use the density of states approximation. But remember, I told you that high T in this case doesn't really mean very high. It means greater than about a Kelvin. Then, last time, we derived the partition function, Z, which is a function of T and volume, as 1 over n factorial times 2m to the 3 over 2 times volume divided by 4 pi squared h bar cubed times the integral from 0 to infinity of epsilon to the half e to the minus epsilon over kvt. The epsilon all to the power n. So I think this is the last equation I wrote down in the last class. So you see here various terms. We've already worked out the volume dependence. Okay, this comes from the density of states. This 1 over m factorial is from the fact that the particles are indistinguishable. And this integral is from the density of states approximation. Okay, so to complete this, we need to calculate what this integral is. So I can change. variables here, if I make a new variable u, which I say is epsilon over kvt, so then du is the epsilon over kvt, then this integral becomes kvt to the 3 over 2. I get 1 kvt from here and another one from the epsilon to the half. Then I get the integral from zero to infinity of u to the half times e to the minus u to u. Okay, this is important because we've now pulled the temperature dependence outside of the integral. Right? Here, we had to integrate, and the, th and the thing we integrated was a function of temperature. But here, the temperature dependence is outside the integral, and this, whatever it is, is just a constant. So it's just a number, which we have to calculate. And in fact, I will prove for you now that this number turns out to be the square root of pi over 2. So I'll prove this now, and in doing so, I'll talk about an important function, which we will use several times from now on, which is called the gamma function. Okay, so the gamma function, you may or may not have seen before, is very common in statistical physics, so it's worth going through it in some detail. And it's defined by integrals which look like this, Gamma as a function of z is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of some number u to the z minus 1 times e to the minus u integrate du. So that's definition. So 
So you can compare these two integrals, and you see that here z minus 1 is equal to a half. So therefore, this thing we've got here is the gamma function at 3 over 2. So this has some important properties, which I will state and prove for you now. The first thing is that gamma over half is equal to the square root of pi. The second thing is that if I take gamma as z plus 1, this is the same as z times gamma of z. It has this property. And you see, as a consequence of this property, therefore, gamma of 3 over 2, if I take z equals a half in this formula, gamma of 3 over 2 is a half times gamma of a half. And I've already told you that gamma of a half is root pi. So this is therefore root pi over 2, as I told you it was down there. So these two things here are enough to give me the answer for the ideal gas. But Sometimes we get these integrals with different values of z, so I'll prove one more property, which is actually very easy. Gamma of 1 is equal to 1, and as a consequence of this and this, we get that gamma of an integer n, this is n minus 1 times gamma of n minus 1, is n minus 1 times n minus 2 times gamma of n minus 2. And if you keep going, you can get all the way down to 1. If you keep going, then this becomes n minus 1 times n minus 2 times all the way down to 2 times 1 times gamma of 1. The gamma of 1, I've told you, is equal to 1. So therefore, gamma of n is equal to n minus 1 factorial. That's another very useful result. So this gamma function can be seen as a generalization of the factorial function to non-integer values. So the proof of these statements is all easy. In fact, we've done most of the work already. So let me just prove it for you. first one is gamma over half. Okay. Well, gamma over half is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of u to the minus a half e to the minus u du. Okay, that's from the definition. Now I can make another change of variable. I'm going to say that u is y squared. So this means du. Okay. No, no, no. Sorry. Let me write it the other way around. That's correct, but I can instead write it this way. I'm going to take y as the square root of u. So this means dy is y is u to the half. It's all the same thing. So therefore, dy is a half times u to the minus a half times du. That's good because you see u to the minus half du is what you've got here. So therefore, this becomes twice the integral from 0 to infinity. This just becomes dy, and e to the minus u is e to the minus y squared. But this integral is symmetric, is even in y, so this just becomes the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus y squared dy. And this integral we've already done. We did it when we calculated the normal distribution, and we showed that it was equal to the square root of pi. So these last parts, you just see the notes on the normal distribution, where I proved this result.
Okay, so anyway, now we can use all this, that stuff to put in this equation and see what we get for z. z t of v is 1 over n factorial times 2m to the 3 halves v over 4 pi h pi squared h bar cubed times kvt to the 3 over 2 times this gamma function, which as we said, is the square root of pi over 2 all to the power n. And lots of things simplify here. Okay. Here I've got 2 cubed is 8 square root, so this is square root of 8, and on the bottom I've also got 8. So that gives me 1 over the square root of 8. So I've got m kvt from here over 2 pi. I also get pi to the 3 over 2. h bar cubed, I can write as h bar squared to the 3 over 2. So all of those terms just give me that. And what I'm left with is b. And this is our final, final result for the ideal gas partition function at temperatures of a few Kelvin and above. So it was quite a long journey to get this result, but that's what we find, and now we can see that it does indeed give the properties of the ideal gas that we assumed in the first half of the course. So, what can we find? We'll do a bit more. First of all, we can check the internal energy equation and see that that's right. So, as I told you, the equation here is that it's kBt squared times d by dt is the log of z. Okay. Um, And it's worth splitting this log of z into various different terms. First of all, I've got 1 over n factorial, and the Stirling approximation tells you that 1 over n factorial is approximately minus n log n plus n, so that's minus n log n plus 1. Ah. Let me do it as plus. So, the Stirling approximation for this is going to be minus log n plus 1 here. Then I've got the log of all this stuff. So, I, first of all, I get log v. Then I've got the log of all these constants to the power 3 over 2. So, that gives me 3 over 2 log m k b over 2 pi h bar squared. That's just a lot of constants. And then finally, I've got log of t, also to the power 3 halves. So I get plus 3 halves log t. That all in square brackets. Okay, so... That's that. And you see, when I differentiate with respect to t, the only term that depends upon t is the final one. So therefore, I get that u is n from here, kbt squared times d by dt of only this last term here, which is 3 halves log of t. Derivative of log of t is 1 over t, so that cancels one of the t's here, so I get the final result, u is 3 halves times m times kb times t, which is exactly what I told you it is. In the first part of the course, when I defined an ideal gas, I wrote down two equations of state, and this was one of them for the monatomic ideal gas.
So that shows you I was right. The result I showed you was true. Okay? The ideal gas does indeed have internal energy given by this equation. The other things we want to find are Helmholtz free energy, pressure, and entropy. So I'll find those three things in that order, Helmholtz free energy, and then we'll take a break. Okay, so the definition, well, not the definition, but we showed for the Helmholtz free energy that in the thermodynamic limit, is equal to minus KBT times the log of the partition function. Therefore, F simply from that equation is equal to minus N KBT. And I'll simply join some terms together. Uh, shall I? Maybe not. I'll do it later. Minus log of n plus 1 plus log of v plus 3 halves log mkv over 2 pi h bar squared plus 3 halves log abt. Okay, so that's an equation, quite a long equation, but not particularly complicated for the Helmholtz free energy. Okay, we can also find the pressure P is defined as the change of energy minus the change of energy with respect to volume. That's just the work done. Like P times V is equal to the work done, so that's minus change in energy. This is when you're at constant heat, at constant entropy. And we proved that differentiating u with respect to constant, differentiating u at constant entropy is the same as differentiating f at constant temperature. Minus nine says that. So I need to differentiate this equation with respect to v. And you see that there's log v. So this just gives me 1 over v. Minuses cancel. And I get that this is n k b t times 1 over v. And you see that simply you can rearrange this equation to get it in the familiar form. p v is equal to n k b times t. So this is our second equation for the uh, equation of state for the ideal gas, which I told you many weeks ago. And you see that, again, it's right. So our statistical mechanics, our theory, which told us how entropy is related to the number of microstates and so on, predicts the correct behavior for the ideal gas. We get these two equations of state, which I gave you at the start of the course. Right, so I think that's a good place to take a break. The final thing we haven't calculated yet is the entropy. So after the break, I'll calculate the entropy, and then we'll summarize the ideal gas derivation. Okay. But what we've done now is very important. At this, the beginning of this course, I just gave you these two equations as empirical results. I said, if you look at a gas, you get this result and this result. But now I've shown that you can derive these results theoretically from statistical mechanics, from the idea that the entropy of a system is related to the log of the number of microstates it has. So this is a very important result to finish. OK, so let's continue from where we were last before we took the break. So 
we've nearly finished deriving the properties of the ideal gas. And in fact, I've shown the two equations of state, which I told you to before, the ideal gas. But we can also calculate something new to us, which is we can use this equation to find the entropy. So the entropy, one of the other equations I proved last week, is that the entropy S as a function of temperature is equal to minus the derivative of the Helmholtz free energy with respect to temperature. If I differentiate that equation with respect to temperature, I will get the entropy. Okay, well, that equation is quite easy to differentiate with respect to temperature. The first, the T outside, this gives me N a, B times all of the stuff in those brackets, minus log N plus 1 plus log B plus 3 half. It's exactly the same, okay? So it's up to you whether you want to write it all out again or not. All that stuff, okay? That's one of the things. Or we can differentiate this T, which will give me 1 over T times 3 halves. So then t's cancel and I just get plus three halves n a b. Okay, so that's quite a complex expression. It can be written in a simpler form if we make some definitions. First of all, n over v, this is the number of particles per unit volume. So I'll call this little n we can call the particle concentration. The number of particles per unit volume, particle concentration. And then I can combine these things into another constant. Which is called the quantum concentration, but notice a function of temperature. Okay. And if I make these definitions, then this equation is very much simplified in terms of the, its writing, at least. This becomes N K B times the log nq over n plus 5 halves. We can note some interesting things about the entropy. The first is true in general, actually. The entropy is always proportional to the size of the system. The S scales proportionally to the number of particles. Its temperature dependence comes in here, QT, and you see that this is like T, like log of T. So S is proportional to log of T. And from this equation, that means it's proportional to the log of the internal energy as well. So entropy looks like log of U times some constant an ideal gas. And finally, it's oh, sorry, no, it's no well, okay. Proportional is not actually true, right? Because you've got a constant term here. So I shouldn't write this. What I should write is it, it grows like okay, a more vague definition. It's strictly, strictly speaking, not proportional because you've got a constant there. But its rate of growth is log of t or log of u. And in the same way, s goes like minus log of n. So increasing the density, that means compressing it, decreases the entropy of the system. Okay. Now, you should know that this equation cannot be quite correct at all temperatures. If I call this equation star, 
note that as temperature goes to zero, star diverges. The entropy goes to minus infinity. The reason the entropy goes to minus infinity is because here you've got log of t and log of zero goes to minus infinity. Right? So it goes to zero because of the log of t term in the entropy. Okay. But you know this cannot be correct because as temperature goes to zero, the system goes into the ground state, and the ground state is unique. So there's a single unique ground state, therefore it has zero entropy. So as t goes to zero, the system goes into the ground state, And the ground state is unique, and therefore it has zero entropy. The ground state is unique. This means that S, which is defined as KB times the log of the number of microstates, well, there's only one microstate because it's unique, so this is KB times log of 1, which is 0. Sorry to write at the bottom of the book. But, in, in fact, this is generally true. Ground states are almost always unique, and therefore the entropy of the ground state is almost always 0. So for virtually all systems at zero temperature, the entropy should become 0. So that means that there's a problem with this equation at low temperatures, but we already expected that because we've made approximations which assume that the temperature is high, and we assume that the particles are in different energy levels.